For me, deep study is like having an ice cream sundae. I could just have the ice cream, but the toppings just make it so much better. I use the inductive study method, which is using the Bible itself as the main source of study. I begin by first reading through one chapter at a time to establish the context, and then I'll go back and reread them, but this time I'll mark keywords or phrases um, to help me understand what the author is trying to convey. The next thing I do is some cross-referencing, looking at uh, other scriptures that God teaches about the same topic or event. The repetition of all of those steps forces me to slow down and helps me to better understand what God wants to teach me. Sometimes in study, it's also helpful to look at the culture of the time, um, who was involved in what, um, where they are, what time period they are. Using these other sources in addition to inductive Bible study really brings the word to life. The Bible is our spiritual nourishment, so I believe the deeper we study, the more spiritually nourished we're going to become. So when a person comes to the cross, acknowledges their sin, their need for Jesus, and accepts the grace and the forgiveness and the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. When a person comes to the cross and receives God's forgiveness, they're washed clean, they're saved, and then we take the hand of God and begin to walk with him as our leader, as the Lord of our lives. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit of the living God moves inside of us. Doesn't matter if you're five years old and you became a Christian like my wife Sherry, or 16 like, like myself, or in your 40s or 50s like about a dozen, 15 people in the last couple of weeks at Shoreline who become followers of Jesus. When that moment comes, the Holy Spirit of God moves in. And then, when a person in whom the Spirit of God lives opens this book, the Word of God, that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, something happens every single time. When we open this book and read, and this book inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we read it, we listen to it, we hear a sermon preached, we are in a Bible study, we open God's word, the Spirit of God who's, who's breathed to life his word speaks to our heart, and the Spirit of God lives in us, something happens. And we learned last week, one thing that happens is it can be as sweet as honey. You can, you can partake of God's word, and you can just go, mmm, mmm, mmm. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, that is so good. It's so comforting. It's so encouraging. It's just so sweet. Sometimes that's what God does. We read his word and we go, mm. But sometimes when we read God's word, what happens isn't, mm. What happens is this. We read God's word, we open it, we begin to read, and this is what we go. We go, uh-oh, Somebody, got, somebody jumped ahead of me. Somebody said, uh-oh, yeah. Sometimes we read the word of God and it convicts us and it challenges us. And it should. You want to know why? Because it's the very word of God and we're not perfect yet. We're not fully there yet. And so there's times where we open this book and it's sweet as honey, but there's also times where God uses his word to teach us, to instruct us, to challenge us, to make us more like him. We challenged you last week to do a 30-day kind of experience. A 30-day journey of reading God's word. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to start today. If you started last week and you've fallen off, start again today. But here's the challenge. Do one of these two things. For 30 days, read one chapter a day in the Bible or follow the Shoreline Reading Guide. And each day, try to find one thing that God speaks to you of encouragement or challenge, whatever it is, and reflect on that and try to live it out. Or... For some of you, we challenge you, if you've never done this, to dig deeper into God's Word. And we have actually two commentaries, a general introduction to the Bible. And then if you get any of these books, uh, we'll give you a, a, just a free little uh, a notepad to go with it. We've got all these at cost, basically our cost plus shipping. And so we're not making money on these. We're just trying to get them into your hands. But if you want to dig into the book of James for 30 days, read a chapter a day. And we have a study guide that goes along with it that we tuck in there for you. And, and then also use these commentaries and resources and really dig into the book of James God's going to do something in your heart and your life. But the key is this. We want to get everyone who's part of Shoreline to every day open this book and just explore and see what God is going to do. And, and here's the reality. Read the Bible. <clears throat> it should challenge, convict, and change us. 
When we read the Bible, something should happen. We should not be the same people we were before. Reading the Bible should challenge, convict, and change a person who really takes it seriously and lets the Spirit of God speak to their heart. I remember as a young pastor, I was working with students, high school students, and this one young guy had become a Christian about the same age I became a Christian. And he, and he was a brand new Christian. He was gonna be a junior in high school that year. And he had grown up completely outside of the church, never held a Bible, never seen a Bible. We gave him his first Bible. And before he began to read the Bible, he came to me and he said, he said, you know, I'm a Christian now. And I know that means that my, you know, some things in my life will probably change. And then he said to me, he said, like, I have a girlfriend right now. And like, we're sleeping together. We're having sex. He says, that's probably not good for me to do, right? <laughs> and I didn't answer him. I didn't tell him yes or no. I said, here's what I want you to do. And I gave him five or six different Bible passages. I said, read the Bible in these passages and you come back and tell me. See, because it's always better than to tell somebody you shouldn't to say, let, the, let God talk to them, right? Let God's word speak to them. They're, they're going to forget what I say, but they won't forget what God says. He comes back to me a couple days later. He says, I'm not supposed to be sleeping with my girlfriend. I said, well, why do you say that? And he started to explain. He says, well, you know, so you're supposed to respect women. And he says, because you, because you're to wait till you're married. And he starts, he starts telling me what the Bible says. And I said, well, I think you got it. He says, yeah, I already told my girlfriend I'm not sleeping with you anymore. <laughs> and uh, he says, and I went home. He says, my mom, single mom, she says, she has different guys over a couple different nights a week. And I said to her, mom, you got to stop that. you got to stop sleeping with the guys. The Bible says you shouldn't do that. And I said, well, you know, I got a call from her. <laughs> from mom. <laughs> so what, what are you telling my son? I said, oh, it's not me. It's the Bible. I pointed, I said, I said over there, you know. Um, <laughs> and she became a really dear friend. And, uh, and, but but it, you know, she was like, you know, her, son, her son said, well, we're not supposed to be living this way, mom. And he, she wasn't a believer yet. She wasn't ready for that. But he was. Can I tell you, this young high school kid, his life changed. Because when he became a Christian, the Spirit of God moved into him, and God's Word began to speak to him in all kinds of areas of his life. And so I want to share with you out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And 2 Timothy 3 talks, it, it, this is written from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Timothy, who grew up in a home of faith. So he'd been around the Scriptures his whole life. I didn't grow up in that kind of environment. This young guy that became a Christian, I was just telling me, it didn't grow up in that environment. But Timothy did. So the Apostle Paul is writing to him, telling him about what God's Word does. And here's what he says in verse 14 of 2 Timothy 3. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy... You have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul says to Timothy, when you read the Bible, it makes you wise in how to be saved through faith in Jesus. But you have to, have to understand that some Christians think that's the end of the deal. Oh, I'm, I became wise for salvation. I'm a Christian. No, I'm done. I'm in the club. No, that's the beginning. That's the start of a journey of growing to be more like Jesus. So the passage goes on in verse 16. For all scripture is God-breathed. And useful for teaching, rebuking, you know what that is? That's pointing out what's wrong. Correcting, that's fixing what's wrong. And training in righteousness, equipping us. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul says to Timothy, God's word, yes, it's, it's to show you the way to salvation. That's the starting point. But also there's times we open up this book. And you know, sometimes, you, and, and here's the beauty of it. You know, later today, you open your Bible to spend some time in the Word, or tomorrow morning, you open the Scriptures. You don't know what's going to happen. You might read it, and you just, it just might be, oh, it's, I need that comfort. That's as sweet as honey. It's just so encouraging. That might be one. I, I love those days when I read the Word, and it just blesses and encourages me. But some days, you'll open this book, and it will rebuke and correct and train you. And can I tell you something? I've grown to love those days too when that's what God's word does. Because in my heart of hearts, and I know if the spirit of God lives in you, in your heart of hearts, our greatest desire is that we would become more like Jesus. And that means things in me gotta change. And this book will show me where my words are out of line, where my attitude, my motives, my heart, my behaviors, my actions, whatever it is, my thoughts, this book will correct and rebuke and train and equip us to be more like Jesus. And our hearts long for that, even in those moments that we're not sure that's what we long for. It is, if you're a follower of Jesus. And if you become a Christian, your heart will long to be more like Jesus. And you will delight with every step you take in becoming more like him. So sometimes we read this book and it's as sweet as honey. But sometimes... It's more like an instruction manual or a rule book 
or guidelines for how we live our lives. And so, so you see up here, you know, if you're going to rebuild the engine of a 1967 Camaro, you want an instruction manual. And if you finish and you have 14 extra pieces left over in your rebuild, something's wrong. And you got to go back and say, okay, what needs to be put where for this thing to work? And, and I was thinking about this. I, there was a guy sitting right over here at First Service who's a, who's a golf professional. And so as I was talking about this, I realized there's a golf pro over here listening to me talk about golf. Uh, but there, there's rules to golf. And, and there's all kinds of rules to golf. And, and some of those rules are about putting. And I want to share, even if you're, not, if you're a non-golfer, this will make total sense to you, okay? If you hit your golf ball and it goes on the green where you're going to start putting, your ball's sitting there on the green. And we're going to say that this right here is the hole I'm putting into, all right? What the rules of golf allow you to do is to take a marker and to mark your ball. Then you can pick it up and clean it. You can move it out of the way of somebody else's putting and you're blocking their ball. So what the rules of golf allow you to do is to put something, usually it's a small round object, behind, directly behind the ball in line with the hole and then you can pick the ball up. If you don't put a marker down, it's a penalty. But if you put a marker and you can pick the ball up, you can clean it. And then when you go back to put it back, the rules say you're supposed to put it in the exact same place where it was. So all you're doing is, is that you have the right to clean it, but then you've got to put it back exactly where it was. Well, through the years, I've studied people who I golf with. I can tell you a lot about their character by how they golf. <laughs> and I'm golfing with a guy who's a member of one of the top courses in the country. They've done U.S. Opens and Ryder Cups at this course. I mean, and he's a member of a really top-ranked course. First time I played with him, first hole, He's on the green. He goes to mark his ball. And everybody watch this. What he's supposed to do is he's supposed to put the marker directly behind the ball on line with the hole and pick the ball up. But that's not what he did. Here's what he did. And he, and he tried to do it kind of quickly like you wouldn't notice. But what? here's what he did. He walks up to the ball. He literally tosses his marker about six inches ahead and sweeps <laughs> up the ball real quick. Like no one's going to notice. Right? So then when he goes to put his ball back again, guess, he, he, he literally puts it about six inches ahead of where it is and then sweeps up the marker real quick. And I'm thinking, hey, if you mark your ball two more times, you're in the hole. Um, <laughs> you know, and, I, and so by the second or third hole, I say to one of the other guys, I said, I said, I said are you watching this? Now, there's a name for that. You know what that's called? Cheating, Cheating exactly, because there, there's rules, right? Um, and, and in all of life, you look and go, it's no, fun to, it's no fun to go out and play with somebody when you know that their score doesn't reflect the right score because they're cheating. Well, as, as you walk through life, God's word becomes like that rule. You know, what are the rules of the game? How do you have the best possible life? How do you live the way God designed? Now, do we not follow what God says sometimes? Yeah, sometimes we don't follow it. But we're missing out on the blessing at that point of becoming all he wants us to become. And so God gives these, these directions and guidelines for how to live your life and how to conduct yourself in relationships and how to behave in the business world. God's, God's book speaks to every aspect of life. And if it doesn't speak to it, if it doesn't speak to it uh, specifically, it speaks in a general sense that you can apply his truth to almost any area of your life. So when you read God's word, you need to brace yourself. Because sometimes it's going to convict, challenge, and want to change us. And then you have to decide, will I let God's word change me? Am I, am I delighted to say, God, make me who you want me to be? So we're called to know God's word and to grow up in faith, to let God's word speak to us and grow us. We're actually called, when we become a Christian, to become more mature in faith. We're called to walk and grow in maturity and become more like Jesus over, over time in our thoughts and our words and our actions and everything we do, being more and more shaped into the image of Jesus. So in the book of Hebrews, we read these words. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to people who've been Christians for a long time. They've been Christians so long that they ought to be mature enough to teach others. But they're not. They're still babies in the faith. And so this is a rebuke and a challenge. But listen to what God's spirit inspires. and what the people. So the people receive this letter, and this is what they're told. Verse 12, Hebrews 5. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you, and not just to teach you, but what's it say? The elementary truths. You still have to be taught the basics of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. What are you saying to somebody when you say to them, oh, you can't eat big people food, you need milk. So what are you calling them? Baby. You're calling, now you can, well, he's not calling them a baby. Keep reading the passage, all right? <laughs> Verse 13, anyone who lives on milk being still an... Infant, he's saying, your baby spiritually is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food 
is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward in maturity. The writer of Hebrews is saying, it's time to grow up. It's time to become more mature in your faith. It's time to, not, to, to, to stop drinking milk and to, and to feed on the, the, the meat of God's word and let it grow you. And then in Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul in verse 9 is addressing a similar kind of a theme. And he says this. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. So here's the Apostle Paul. We're praying. Here's what his prayer is. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Through, the, through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. He said, I want you to grow in knowledge, in wisdom, in understanding, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, growing up, growing into maturity. I want you to imagine a, 20 year, a young 20-year-old woman who becomes a follower of Jesus. She hasn't grown up in the church but she's heard about Jesus. She's become his follower. She's 20 years old. She says, okay, I'm saved now. I believe in Jesus. And for the next 10 years, she pops into church once or twice a year and she has a Bible somewhere and she pulls it out when she's desperate for a little bit of encouragement, but doesn't really open it and read it. She doesn't talk to Jesus in prayer unless she's like totally in trouble and then if God doesn't do what she wants, she's kind of mad because, well, God, look at I, you know, you don't take care of me and, and she, she's not generous in her giving and she's not serving anywhere and she's not sharing. She's just kind of, I became a Christian and 10 years go by and then 20 years and then 30 years and 45 years goes by. She's now 65 years old. How mature is she? as a follower of Jesus at 65. Is she more mature just because she's older? What's the answer? No. Time doesn't grow maturity. Feeding on God's word, following him does. Now, here's another young woman, 20 years old. She becomes a follower of Jesus. Also doesn't come out of a Christian home, but she falls in love with Jesus. She understands his salvation, but she wants to take his hand and follow him. So she reads God's word every day. And when her life's out of line with his word, she says, God, help me. And she, she strives to follow him. She talks to God in prayer every day with her joys and her pains and her frustrations and her celebrations. She's just talking to God in prayer. And she finds a place to serve in the church and in the community. And she's learning to be generous. And, she's, and, and, and now three years go by. And she's 23 years old. Is it possible that this 23-year-old young woman is more spiritually mature at this point than the 65-year-old? What's the answer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, the, and the, in these passages, what it's saying is, listen, your spiritual maturity isn't based on how long you've been sitting in a church. It's based on how you're growing up in your faith and responding to God's leading and his promptings and sometimes his rebuke and sometimes his correction. You're letting your life be shaped by Jesus. So what I want to do with the moments we have left is just to read some passages from the Bible that, that, that I suspect will feel like a rebuke and correction to all of us. And that's a good thing. We should be saying, Lord, correct me. Shall we try that? We should be saying, Lord, correct me. One, two, three. Lord, correct me. That's pretty good for a first try. <laughs> so, so listen to God's word. And I'll, there's some different areas that maybe are the area, some of the areas that might speak to our hearts today. So, here's one area that we should brace ourselves and let God convict, challenge, and change us. We're called to hear God's word and take action. We're called to, every time we read God's word, if it challenges us, we're supposed to do something about it. Listen to God's word from the book of James. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Please be clear, Bible. <laughs> do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says... It's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. God's word is so clear and this challenges us. Don't just listen to a sermon. Hear a challenging word. And walk away unchanged. 
Don't just listen to your Bible as you drive into work or, or read your Bible at, at home or, or, or you're on a lunch break. Don't just read God's word and when the Spirit says, you know, right there, that's the area you need to grow. Don't just kind of close it and say, okay, God gave you a mirror, you saw, man, there's a big chunk of broccoli stuck between my teeth. That's kind of disgusting, but oh, don't worry about it. You walk away and all day long, it's still, still right there. You know, so, hey, how you doing? Nobody wants to tell you, but there it is. You know. It says, don't, don't do that. H- have you ever read God's word, listened to God's word, heard a sermon, been in a Bible study, and the Holy Spirit of God says, that's for you. And, and, and you go, thank you, Lord. And you just go on with your life. Forget what you read. Forget what you saw. And so just pause and say, Lord, when I hear a sermon, when I'm in a Bible study, when I read the word, when I listen to the scriptures, if your Holy Spirit, through your word, speaks to my heart, which is just filled with your spirit, and you challenge me, you rebuke me, you correct me, God, I'm not going to ignore it. Maybe for some of you right now, you're going, oh man, there's something for weeks or months or years the Holy Spirit's been saying, that's not for you, that's not for you. That attitude, that motive, that behavior, the way you speak, what you do, that's not for you. Lord, may this be the day that we hear your word and do what it says. Brace yourself. Because God's word convicts, challenges, and it changes. If we'll let it, it'll, he changes. God doesn't force us to change, but God offers us a way. And the power of his spirit to live in it, we have to choose to follow. Here's another area. We're called to guard our mouth. We're called to guard our mouth. So I want to ask you to let God's word speak. Will you listen to these words from James chapter 3? These words are about our mouths and the power of what we say. And so often, we just say things and and don't even think through the implications and we're warned about our words and how harmful and hurtful they can be. So listen to God's word and if he if he challenges you, if he convicts you, just in your heart say, "Let me have it, Lord. Change me." James 3 beginning in verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. But anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. What it means is perfectly mature, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. The, small is a, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Well, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. The tongue is itself set on fire by hell. Is that a warning? Anybody catching the subtle message here? right? Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed, and they have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Don't ever drop your guard on your mouth. You might tame it a little bit for now, but before you know it, and it's a wild animal again. Verse 9, with the tongue, We praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Do you let God's word speak to you? Do you you feel the conviction? Man, our words of gossip are like poison. Our lies come right from the pit of hell. When we lie, we join in the the chorus of the father of lies, the enemy who speaks his native language is lying. When we lie, we're entering into that world. Our harsh, thoughtless words that cut like knives. The book of Proverbs says, like sword thrusts. Do you hear God's word and say, oh, that's not for me, that's not for me, that's not for me, I don't want to deal with that. Or do you say, God, change me. Make me more like Jesus. Let your word come alive in my heart and alive in my life. God's word speaks to so many different things. Here's another one. Brace yourself. God's word convicts, challenges, and changes us. We're called to seek sexual purity in an anything-goes world. And we have to let God's word speak. 
I mean, our world is getting further and further and further down the road of anything goes, anytime, anywhere, anyone, any group, anything, doesn't matter. No one can tell me what to do. It's my life, and I can do what I want. That's the world we live in. And then God intrudes into our world and tells us the best way to live. God says, I made you, and I know what's best for you. Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 are all about boundaries with our sexuality as men and women and how we relate to each other, having wise boundaries. But in chapter 5, verse 7, we read this. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. This is an adulterous woman, a woman who's trying to seduce you. This goes for men or women. This is just, it's saying, you know, be careful of sexual seduction. It says, keep your path, your, your path far from her, far from seduction. Do not go near the door of her house. Man, don't even go anywhere near that stuff. Lest you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house, and your toil enriches the house of another. And at the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. And I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. And then Proverbs uses this imagery of water, of drinking fresh water as a picture of sexual intimacy in a marriage. And the Bible's not shy to talk about sexuality. It's just always within the covenant of marriage and in a way that honors God. But in that covenant, there's this beautiful picture of this fresh water. So listen, this image, of, again, water is an image of sexual intimacy in a, with a married couple. So here's what, here's what it says in verse 15. So drink water from your own cistern. Take your water from your own, you know, your own well. Running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, if you're not believing me yet that this picture of water is a sexual one, let me keep reading. Okay, rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. That's not so subtle, right? It's right there in the Bible. But, 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 that, that, but, God says, but, but I want to warn you. He says, be careful of taking your intimacy outside that covenant. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord. And he examines all your paths. Boy, in a world that sexually says, do anything, anything goes, God says, man, enjoy that covenant. Make it beautiful, make it good. That's why I'm so excited that we have a marriage weekend coming up here at Shoreline. We got Gary Thomas coming. If you're not signed up for that Saturday event coming up, it's just a few weeks away, but be part of that. It's gonna encourage you. It's gonna challenge you to cherish each other, to love each other well. And then another one last area. Brace yourself. God's word convicts, challenges, and changes us. And we can look at lots of areas, but I just wanna look at one more where, where God might speak to our hearts and challenge us to change. And that's where we're called to battle the flesh and to walk in the spirit. And we let God's word speak. That, that there's something in us that... Even when we become a Christian, there's something in our, in our nature that wants to be drawn towards sin. And God says, don't be drawn towards that. Be drawn towards the spirit, the things that honor God. And so in Galatians chapter 5, uh, we read these words in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. And it's looking at this contrast of being drawn to the things of the flesh or walking in the spirit. And maybe it's something here will challenge you. So it says this in verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is just kind of a wild party spirit. It's debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And when it says and the like, it means and a bunch of other stuff. There's things that we can wander into that aren't honoring to God. I warn you as I did before. That those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is not the pathway to the life into the kingdom of God. But then the passage shifts and says, but, but there's a way to live that honors God. And when you hear this, we should say, that's what I long for. And sometimes I'm on the flesh side of things. I've got to stop that and follow God more closely. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who believe in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in us, let us stay in step with the Spirit. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus, the Spirit of God has moved into you. And then when you read this Spirit-given, Spirit-breathed Word of God, and that touches your heart, something happens every single time. And sometimes you don't feel what's happening. It's like eating a healthy meal. You don't just, you just say right afterwards, oh, I feel the nutrients making my body stronger. You have to eat, you know, but when you eat healthy meals day by day, it strengthens you. Some days you're going to feel it and notice what God does. Some days you won't, but God's doing something every time you open this book, every time. And so, so tomorrow, later today, tomorrow, the next day, when you open this book and you read, for some of you, you're, what you read and what's happening in your life, it's going to be just as sweet as honey. And you're going to, oh, I feel comforted. I feel encouraged. It's just like, oh, that's so good. And we need those moments. But some days we're going to read this book. And it's going to rebuke and correct and train us. And we should in those moments say, God, thank you. By the power of the Spirit who lives in me, give me strength to live in the way I should live and to guard my mouth, to guard my eyes, to guard my mind, to guard my hands, to guard my life and make me more like Jesus. Because I know if you are a follower of Jesus or if one day you become a follower of Jesus, you don't want to just say, okay, now I'm a Christian and I'm stuck. You want to day by day, day by day, grow to become more like Jesus. That's the desire of our hearts. That's our longing if we've come to the cross. And so Jesus, that's our prayer today. Our prayer is that we would read your book every day or listen to it every day. That we'd get, jump into a Bible study or that we'd come here week by week and open the word and learn from the scriptures. But Lord, when you speak through your word, Lord, sometimes we thank you for those moments where it's just as sweet as honey. We thank you for those moments where we're encouraged and blessed and lift up. We need those days. But we dare to thank you and pray for those days when you challenge and when you convict and when you shine the light on something that needs to change in us. And we want to say right now, Lord, we want to become more like Jesus. Use your word to speak the truth, to correct us, and to guide us exactly where you want us to be. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone said...